Hi, this is Pastor Tim Bagwell. I'm so glad that you're watching. I've got such an incredible word to share with you today. I believe it's going to impact your mind, your spirit, your body, your finances, because there's something about the word. The word will make you free. I know that God cares about you and he cares about your family. He wants to touch your loved ones that are lost. He wants to heal the family member that's sick. He wants to help you be the person that God has called you and ordained you to be. I know that what you're getting ready to hear is going to liberate you, encourage you, and give you strength to face the battles that you're about to face in the future. Well, remember this, we care about you, we're praying for you, for your family, and most of all, remember, you are who God says you are. I want, I want to do the best that I can with this, but early Sunday morning, God dropped something in my spirit, and I know this, I know that what God is about to do in this house is attached to some of these things that God has brought to me in a story that you will know so well, but I want you to have fresh ears for it tonight. Will you do that? Will you track with me? Because I believe when this thing is done, when we get to the end of this, that there is going to be an illumination. Everybody say illumination. See, sometimes it's not a new thing. It's that God reveals what's been there all along. But it's in a timing that is to his divine providence. Meaning God doesn't, and I've said this here before, but God doesn't hide things from us. He hides things for us. And in the right timing and in the right season, he reveals those things so that we can step into that revelation and then see it manifest in our lives, our church, our city, and our families. So I want to I want to dive into this real quickly, and then we're going to get back into this flow because I want to minister this just a little bit. So I want to be as fast as I can because I want to minister it as well as preach it. Amen. So turn your Bible, John 2, remain standing with me and just kind of read along. I'm going to read the first 11 verses in a very familiar story. But I, I want you tonight to act like you are hearing this for the very first time. I want you to have spirit eyes and spirit ears to hear, and I want you to put yourself you know, the Bible is not a book about God. Well, let me try that over here. <coughs> the Bible is not a book about God. The Bible is God. Mm. And we have to learn to insert ourselves into the time and season and revelation that God is bringing to us. So I want you to find yourself in here tonight. Are you ready? Here it is. And the third day, there was a marriage in Cana. And the mother of Jesus was there, and both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said unto them, they have no wine. And Jesus said, woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet. Everybody say, not yet. And his mother said to the servants, don't you just love mother? She acted like she didn't hear a thing he said. Every mother in the house, raise your hand. I just want to see all the people who have selective hearing that are in the building tonight. She didn't hear anything he said. She went right along and he, she said to the servants, whatever he tells you to do, do it. And there were set Six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews containing two or three firkins apiece. And Jesus said, fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, draw out now and bear to the governor of the feast. And they bear it. The ruler of the feast tasted the water that was made wine. And he didn't know what had gone on. But the servants which drew the water knew. And the governor of the feast called the bridegroom and said to them, every man... 
At the beginning doth set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. But you have kept the good wine, watch, until now. Everybody say now. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cain of Galilee and manifested forth his glory, and his disciples believed on him. I want to talk just for a second. God birthed this thing in me in a different level on Sunday morning because this is the season we've been talking about seasons. Boy, I couldn't believe. Did it snow here today or was I in a dream? Come on, y'all. It's May. And I saw the rain falling. This morning I thought, whoa, that's prophetic. Hallelujah. Because there is a season that God has given us. And in this season there is a reveal. That's what I want to talk about tonight. Before you're seated, just tell two or three people standing around you, there's about to be a revealing in your life tonight. It's time for the great reveal. Amen. Hallelujah. Okay, track, track with me quickly. Track with me quickly and stay engaged with me. God spoke this word to me on Sunday morning, and it centered on the third day. Everybody say third day. In between Calvary and Pentecost, 50 days post the resurrection, in between the resurrection and Pentecost, we have the effects that take place during those 50 days of the third day. So understand that what the third day signified, which was dead things coming back to life. The third day signified authority over the death, hell, and the grave. The third day signified a brand new day for the body of Christ. It signified that hope had come to the world because now men did not need fear, sickness, or death. Why? Because now we have have a greater hope. All of these things were a part of the effects of the third day. And you understand that after the third day, those effects did not cease. Those effects continued and really began to multiply as Jesus began to show himself alive after many infallible proofs. He was freed from a mortal body that got tired and weary. Now he was walking the earth and his real nature now could be revealed to all who would believe. So in John 2, you are witnessing. Now understand, John 2 is before Calvary, resurrection, 50 days, Pentecost. But in John 2, there is a shift in the ministry of Jesus Christ from age 12 to age 30, we don't hear anything about Jesus. We don't know what he's up to. We don't know what's going on in his life. We don't know what's happening in Jesus. We see him last as a 12-year-old in the temple. Now, all of a sudden, he shows up 30 years old on the third day. Amen. He's been hidden from view. He's been secluded. And listen, the two days leading up to the third day are always days of seclusion and concealment. I'm going to preach this thing. When you feel like you've been hidden and secluded and in darkness and concealed, don't lose hope. I said don't lose hope because there's more going on in the darkness than you could possibly begin to imagine. 
They rolled the stone over the grave. You couldn't see what was going on in there. But can I tell you, there was some stuff happening beneath the surface. Some of you think because of your hidden moments, you've been secluded and concealed. Baby, you're just in the two days that lead up to the third day. And on the third day, there's going to be a revealing in your life that you never could have received without the two days that led up to your third day. Amen. The third day, Jesus has been living a regular life. Everybody say regular. Amen. He was just a boy. He grew up in his mom and daddy's home, went to work with his father, learned the skills of carpentry. He was going to church, being faithful uh, to worship in the temple, but it was just regular. You know what it takes to break regular in your life? A third day. Oh, I want to talk to somebody in here. Listen, you can be regular, but not after the third day. Amen. It takes the third day to break regular normal off of our lives. Can I prophesy to you and tell you that God is about to, in fact, I want to wage war against regular. Normal. How about we receive a new normal? Amen. It takes a third day to break regular off of our life. God wants to break the pattern and insert a new normal for our lives. Amen. In the third day, there's a revealing of everything that God has called you and I to be. What was secret and what was unknown comes to light and the real you stands up. Oh, Jesus was in a body of flesh, but after the third day, the real Jesus stood up with all power in his hand. Can I tell you, the real you is about to emerge from a season of seclusion and concealment. I prophesy over you, word of life, you are about to come out of your season of concealment, and the real you is about to stand up. Hallelujah. It took the tomb to reveal who Jesus really was. Sometimes it takes moments of pain, difficulty. Even Jesus did not want to walk this path. He said, Father, if there's any other way. How many of you have ever prayed that prayer? If there's any other way. And God says, there is no other way. Because what I'm after is the revealing of the real you. Life has made you average, normal. You've gotten a pattern of regular, but your two days of concealment are about to break open into a third day reveal. Amen. Hallelujah. So let's dig into this just a little bit. John 2 starts out like this, and the third day, I just want to ask you, that's a strange way to start a chapter. The third day from what? What happened on the first day? Watch this. When we stepped over the timeline in 2000, how many of you remember Y2K? Was that the dumbest thing you ever saw? People were gathering. I mean, listen, I saw people, Christian people. I mean, they were they had 92 cases of water. It's like the Holocaust or the doomsday was about to happen all over again. The world was going to blow up. But watch this. Something prophetic took place when we stepped into 2000. Why? Because a day with the Lord is a thousand years. And a thousand years is a day. So when we stepped across 2,000, we stepped into God's prophetic third day. Oh, Jesus, just look at your neighbor and say, you're living in your third day moment. You are in the third day right now. And the third day, what is happening here is this. We don't know what it was the third day from. 
What we do know is that God is establishing a new pattern for third day season. Ooh, I'm going to dig into this. Hallelujah. I better hurry. I got 25 minutes. Watch this now. The third day, there was a marriage in Canaan. So here's what I want you to understand. We're in the middle of the resurrection and Pentecost. But understand that when Jesus rose from the grave, it wasn't just what happened on the third day. It was the new pattern that the third day created. Oh, my goodness. Come on, somebody. There's about to be a new pattern established in your life in this season. Amen. The third day, there was a marriage in Canaan. Here's what I want you to know. Miracles always show up in the middle of covenant. Hallelujah. It's no wonder, because remember, Jesus had been in hiding. We don't know what's been taking place. He's been in a prophetic two-day season of seclusion and concealment. But now he comes out of hiding on what? Stay with me. The third day. Here he comes emerging, and what event does he choose to work his first miracle? Right in the middle of covenant. Let me tell you something. The remnant church is a church of divine covenant. We better understand the covenant that you and I have been brought into. And you know what? Covenant is an exchange. You know what covenant is? God says, I'll give you my life. But I want yours in exchange. There's a lot of people, they're crying out to God. I need a miracle. I need a breakthrough. You get in covenant, you'll get a miracle. You'll get a breakthrough. But God wants your life. Let me get practical. It's not only a covenant with God, but it is a covenant with his house. I meant to say this yesterday. It is going to rain, but you better be sure you're planted when it does. I said, you better make sure you're planted when it rains. Now, everybody wants to come to church, and they want to sit with their feet underneath the table, and they want to partake of the groceries that somebody else's sweat and labor and prayer and sacrifice has brought but then there is no covenant with the house of God. Now, you got to get some roots in this season. I said, you got to get some roots. We all want to be the fig tree blooming in the sun. Can I tell you, you got to be as deep as you are tall. Talk to me, somebody. I said, you got to be as deep as you are tall. Like I talk to my people. You better grow you some roots. I'm tired of tumbleweeds. Come on, somebody. Well, I, I just go to church where the Spirit sends me. Well, I hope he sends you somewhere else and sends me somebody with a root system that holds them in the midst of the storm. Amen. It's a covenant. We all want breakthrough. Don't want to be in covenant. Amen. We need to learn what covenant. God said, I'll give you my life. But covenant is an exchange. I want your life. Amen. Salvation is an exchange of lives. He gives you yours, but you've got to give yours to him. Amen. Now watch what he says. Let me get over here. Hallelujah. Watch what he says. So miracles show up in the middle of covenant. Amen. Now look at verse number three. Here is the problem and the solution all in one. And when they wanted wine, circle the word wanted, because in the third day, God moves us beyond need 
<laughs> Hallelujah. Into the area of desire. What do you want? What is your passion? What are you really hungry for? Listen, we cannot feed the world, evangelize the world, clothe the world, if all God does is meet our needs. God is aligning a church, a remnant church, with his heart. You know the scripture that says, oh, how does it, it start? Uh, I don't know everything, just some things. Let me think here. Amen. It's a scripture that says, uh, he supplies the desires of my, how does it go? My God, no, it's about the desires of my heart. He, I'm just asking, come on. Watch this now. And he will give you. Now, see, the way we look at it is we desire it and he gives it to us. No, he gives you the desire woo, that is aligned with his. How do you think God gets his will perpetrated in the earth? He gets a people to align with his desire. Desire turns into prayer. Prayer is laden with faith. And God does what he intended to do in the first place because he gets a people to want what he wants. When they wanted wine. Why is this significant? Because this is the first miracle which establishes the third day pattern. And desire is a part of God's pattern of getting his will in the earth. you got to want it. Amen. I think half the problem with the church, we have a lot of them. That's okay because we're built to solve all of them. But half of our problem is a spirit called apathy. Amen. We don't just don't have what we need because we don't ask for what we need. We don't know what to want. We don't know what to desire. Gee, they, listen, they didn't, Mary did not even know. That she was becoming a part of a brand new cycle. If they didn't want wine, John 2 would have not started in this fashion. There's some stuff God can't start. I feel like preaching in here tonight. There's some stuff he can't start until you start wanting the right thing. Oh, God, give us your heart. Give us your heart. And when they wanted, how many of you are ready to move beyond the season of him supplying your needs into the season of him responding to the desires of your heart that have aligned with his will? Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Now look at verse number four. Jesus says, what's that got to do with me? And his mother, she didn't even skip a beat. She went right to the servants. And here's what she said. Whatever he tells you to do, don't think about it. Because if you think about it, you'll either not do it or you'll procrastinate and miss your window. Just do what he's, that's what I, how I talk to my kids. It doesn't matter why. And I talk to them just like that. I don't really. Sometimes. <laughs> Just do what I say. I used to hate when my dad said that. But why? It doesn't matter. Just do what I say. Write this down. In a third day season, instructions are important. Hallelujah. Instructions in this season are vital. We've got to learn to follow the simplest of instructions. 
You, you know, sometimes in God, we, we think we, we could do it or we could not do it. No, no, no. Do you want to get in a third day season pattern for your life? Do you want to see your life transformed in an absolute instant because of the presence and power of God that is operative in the third day? Then you are going to have to do what he says. And it's the simplest of things. Now, these are not, these, this is not exciting. I can tell by, by how you're looking. But, oh, well. Hey. Whatever. She didn't know what he was going to tell them to do. You've got to get a yes before you get an instruction. <laughs> what was Mary trying to get out of the heart of the servant? He hadn't said anything yet. She just wanted to get a yes before he told them. Some of you are, will wait a lifetime for an instruction because God won't give you an instruction until he gets a yes first. You say, Pastor, why won't he tell me first? Because it might scare you. He's afraid to tell you really his plans until your heart gets a yes. God, I cry out in this house tonight for a whole bunch of yeses. A yes is what shifts my life. And I've got to say yes before I know what he's going to ask me to do. There's a whole lot of servants in here tonight. You better get a yes in your spirit. Whatever you need me to do. Now, I pastor great people, but they're, they're still just sh people. I had a conversation the other day. This is the funniest thing ever. And I get a little ornery sometimes. I don't mean to. Well, sometimes I mean to, but I don't know that I was try just trying to be overly ornery in this situation. But, you know, we've been really working with our church to get ready for what God is going to do. I, I'm a firm believer that God will not send you a harvest. You do not have nets to catch. So we've been building nets. And to build nets, you got to build people. So I've been recruiting and training and raising up leadership. I, my passion is to raise people up. So, I, you know, we're trying to not just get things ready for right now. I'm, I'm looking to the future. So we're talking about children's volunteers. Boy, children's is a hard place to staff. Amen. So I'm, I'm giving my spiel. Well, I had a couple come up. And they said, you know, Pastor, we, we appreciate the, the passion of your heart. We, we just know, you know, that you're just trying to get people involved. But we want you to know we don't feel called to children's ministry. And I said, then why did you have kids? If you wasn't called to children's ministry, you shouldn't have had children. And I never saw two people more astonished and dumbfounded in their life. I said, you do have children, don't you? Then you're involved in children's ministry. <laughs> you're talking about you don't want to do children's ministry, and you go check your kids in the children's, but shame on you. And they went like this. Yes, you're right. People get so spiritual when they're trying to get out of something. So spiritual, you're trying to get out of something. What has he told you to do? Because whatever he says, you feel the resistance in that, right? That's just, see, obedience is difficult. But obedience is what transforms our lives. I don't know what he's going to tell you. But whatever he says, do it. Now, next verse, verse 6. I love the Bible. So he said, whatever he says, do it. Verse 6. And there were how many? Talk to me. How many water pots were there? What is six the number of? Well, Jesus, I'm going to have to find somebody. Are you not sure? What does six stand for? It is the number of what? Of man. God will always be faithful to insert you into situations that reveals to you what lies beyond your human limitations. There were how many water pots? Not just Jesus was there. You got to understand that he was about to train his disciples. 
The first part of the chapter lets you know that not only Jesus, but his disciples also were called to the marriage. So there's the six water pots, and God says, I'm about to insert you into a difficult situation. I mean, listen, turning water to wine, I don't know. I mean, I've tried it a few times, hadn't worked yet. Y'all think I'm crazy, but I do. I do stupid stuff like that, especially when I was young. Amen. Because I think if Jesus did it, then I could too. Hallelujah. Hadn't worked for me yet. But watch this. God will be faithful, and this is the part we reject. I talked a little bit about Paul last night, praying three times, Lord, please take this thorn from me. And I just love how God responds. Are you kidding? I'm trying to show you the ultimate possibilities that exist when you get to the end of yourself. Because when you get to the end of you, I'm just starting to move in your life. I want to preach the word of life and tell you that God will insert us to those moments that reveal his limitless potential when we feel limits all around us. Amen. He told the servants, fill the water pots with water. Now, hold on a second. Look at verse 4. What does he tell Mary? What have I to do with you? My hour is not yet. Everybody say that, not yet. Now, from four to seven is only three verses. How did we get from not yet Can I just help somebody in here? I want to shout, run and roll on the floor at the same time. What are you talking about, Pastor? The third day will reveal to you just how close not yet is from right now. Can I tell you something? Some of you have heard not yet, not yet, not yet, not yet. But can I tell you in the pattern of the third day, not yet and right now are not separated. Oh, Jesus, if you've heard not yet, I dare you to shout because your not yet is about to. I just get beside myself. How many times I've I've just heard not yet, but in the third day pattern, not yet and right now are right next to each other. You're not yet about to become a right now. Not yet in your healing is about to become right now. God is about to be a way maker, and what has been withheld is about to be released. Let me hurry. I gotta quit. Have I done 25 minutes? Don't lie now. Amen. Look at verse number 8. He said, fill the water pots with water. They filled them to the brim, verse 8. And he said to them, draw out. Now, look there. Do you see the presence of a prayer? I'm asking a question. Anybody? Did he pray over it? Nowhere here did he speak a blessing. Nowhere here did he say, in the name, in my name. <laughs> you don't see a blessing in authority. I command you to be made wine. Nowhere. So when did the transformation happen? Because if he had said a prayer, I could pinpoint well, right there. That's where the change took place. Watch. The transformation is in the draw. 
Let me tell you something. In this season, you better learn to draw. First of all, he said, fill the water pots with water. God only transforms what is full. In this season, you cannot afford to be empty. I, I, I declare over you that this is a season you better stay full. You can't come on Sunday and that be the only time you crack your Bible. I got to stay full because God only changes what is absolutely filled to the prayer. I got to have a prayer life. I got to learn to praise him regardless of what it feels like. I got to stay full. But the transformation was in the draw. He said, draw it out and take it to the governor of the feast. When the ruler of the feast tasted the water that was made wine, he didn't know what had gone on. Amen. Draw it out. Because in the draw... You know what draw constitutes? You know when we talk about putting a demand on God. You got to learn to put a demand on the declaration that God has spoken over your life. The obedient draw. And in that draw, there was a transformation. In the third day pattern, you go in flat but you come out fermented. <laughs> Hallelujah. Jesus went in broken, bloody and bruised. He went in ashamed. He went in naked. He went in with his entrails hanging out. He went in flat. But can I tell you, when he emerged on the third day, he came out fermented. Hallelujah. The water of humanity is transformed into the spirit of divinity. When you step into your third day, can I tell you, you're about to. You know what they say? I, I saw this the other day. I, I'm, not a, I, 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 I'm not drawn to alcohol. That never was my my issue, I was kind of, I grew up on the new wine. Once you have the real deal, you, you can't hardly settle for anything else. But there's this store in our city. What's it called, James? Like the something barn. What's it called? Liquor barn. This thing's like a mall for alcohol. And on the outside, what does it say? Wine, something, and spirits. Oh, hallelujah. Can I tell you this? Fermented means that it's full of the, who? Full of the spirit. Can I tell you, when you go in flat, how many knows that sometimes our two days are days where we feel broken, depressed, anxious, hurting, and wounded. We're flat, but you won't stay flat forever because when you come out of your third day season, you're coming out fermented with the spirit of the living God. I got to quit. Almost done. Let's finish it. Now watch what the governor said. He said, you, you've broken the pattern. He said, because the other pattern was that they start with the good wine. And after men have well drunk, they give you the watered down stuff. Why? Because you can't tell the difference at that point. Amen. Some of y'all quit sitting there with your halo crooked on your horns. You, you know what I'm talking about. Amen. Say, break the pattern. Say it. Break the pattern. The governor said, you have broken the pattern. Because you started with the worst wine. And then see what he says. Well, that's the wrong scripture. I'll just get it myself. Here we go. But you have kept the good wine until. 
Say it again. Now. Say it again. Now. Say it again. Now. Watch. The good wine's not for later. Come on, somebody. The good wine's for right now. There's some stuff that's happening in the atmosphere. It's not happening next week. It's not happening next month. God said, I'm bringing you into a brand new pattern, a third day season, and it's not waiting till next month. It's releasing upon you now. And then he quits like this. And this was the beginning of miracles. Can I prophesy over you? This is just the beginning. Can I prophesy over you? This is just the beginning. God said, I'm going to start now, but I'm not stopping. Until the heavens part, you are going to step in to a perpetual third day season with me. This is just the beginning in your life. I prophesied to you tonight. You are standing at the starting gate. Some of us, I put myself in this thing. I wept when God began to speak to me because I feel like there's been some seasons in my life. I've been in the darkness of a two-day season. I've been secluded and concealed. You know, you can get your feelings hurt during those moments like God is not working for your behalf. He's not on uh, the business that concerns you. But can I tell you, the devil is a liar. I said, the devil is a liar. Hallelujah. You are sitting in the middle of a third-day season season and when you come out there is going to be a revealing of the you God has created you to be you say pastor I've been in a season of seclusion and concealment there's been some darkness in my life I've been in love with God. I, I've been faithful to church, but I cannot see what God is doing. You know what he's doing? He's working on you. You're like a caterpillar that's going through the change. You can't see what's going on. You don't know what's happening. Do you know that a caterpillar doesn't know that it's transformed into a butterfly? until it breaks out of the cocoon. I read this the other day. Do you know that when a caterpillar, first of all, that cocoon serves a purpose. Everybody say purpose. Your trial, your season of seclusion, it's not killing you. It's making you. That butterfly transforms and then you know what happens is those wings begin to flex against the side of that cocoon and when the wings get strong enough they break that barrier and the butterfly doesn't understand it but without the cocoon his wings never would have been strengthened to the place he could fly on another level I read this the other day. You know when a butterfly comes out of the cocoon, it does not have any caterpillar DNA left. I feel like running. When you, when word of life, when your family, when you come out, there's not going to be anything left of who you used to be. Come on, get on your feet. Lift those hands all over the house. I'm done. 
I'm done, Father. Tonight, in the next few moments, I pray, let new wine be released in this place. Let new wine be released in this house. Let your glory so fill every heart and every life. Let your glory so move and transition that when we come forth, we are nothing that we used to be. Come on, I want to hear your voices. Lift those hands and let's begin to cry out just for a moment.